Good afternoon, baseball fans, and, and the rest of you. My name is Kristen Anderson, and I'm a professor here in the art department at Augsburg College, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Claire and Gladys Stroman Executive Speaker Series Spring Event. This series brings corporate leaders to campus to share their expertise with our students and our alumni. And over the past four years, the speakers have included Mary Brainerd, CEO of Health Partners, Sally Smith, the CEO of Buffalo Wild Wings, Douglas Baker, CEO of Ecolab, and Richard Davis, the chair of U.S. Bank Corp. And today, we add Dave St. Peter, president of the Minnesota Twins Baseball Club, to that list. Dave St. Peter secured his first job with the Twins as an intern in 1990 after graduating from the University of North Dakota. He quickly earned a full-time position, and in 2002, he was named the fourth president in the history of the Twins organization. He oversees the team's strategic planning process and the club's business operations, including ticket sales and services, corporate partnerships, marketing, public affairs, broadcasting, ballpark operations, human resources, technology, and finance. During his tenure, he's assembled a sales and marketing team that increased attendance by more than 200% over the last decade. And in 2010, the Twins set a new single-season franchise attendance record by attracting more than 3.2 million fans to the beautiful new ballpark. Now, the Strummans are a prominent legacy family here at Augsburg, with many generations attending the college over the decades. Their commitment to the advancement of Augsburg's mission is seen not only in the sponsorship of this series, but also in the Strummans Center for Meaningful Work, our Career Services Center, which helps connect students to internships and careers as they make the transition from students to alums and from the campus to the broader community. As you've already heard, Dave St. Peter has a, a great career. He has a lot of great accomplishments, he has a lot of important responsibilities, and he has a great title. And I'd like to suggest to you a couple of things about his meaningful work. How many of you have been to Target Field? That's good. It's a great place, right? Great place. If you haven't been there yet, uh, you'll have quite a few chances coming up and just around the corner. All that talk about the groundhog, you can just forget that stuff. The true marker, the true harbinger of spring is when the pitchers and catchers report for spring training, signaling the inevitable end of winter. And that's what's happening this weekend for the Minnesota Twins. Soon the baseball season will start and you'll have your choice of 81 home games and some postseason games, right, Dave? Postseason, right? <laughs> you heard it here first, postseason games. And of course, the activities that surround the All-Star Game as well. There are a lot of terrific opportunities to visit Target Field. It's such a great place that you don't even need to enjoy baseball to enjoy Target Field. Just pretend that it's a gigantic outdoor restaurant with lots of great food and crowds and an exciting atmosphere and a few guys playing a game on the grass, sort of down on the lower level of the restaurant, and you can have a great time at Target Field. I can tell you with certainty and with some authority that Target Field is a great place. That's because I'm an expert on sports facilities. I research and I study and I write and I present on the topic. And it isn't just my professional and scholarly opinion that Target Field is a great place. Among many awards that the ballpark has received, Target Field was named the 2011 Sports Facility of the Year by the sports business journal, Sports Business Daily. The Twins have been recognized by ESPN the magazine as having the best stadium experience in all of professional sports. And Major League Baseball has selected Target Field as the site of the 2014 All-Star Game. Now as an architectural historian, I can tell you that these things don't just happen. You have to have creative and talented architects and skilled and experienced contractors, but you also need clients who are imaginative and committed and collaborative. And Dave St. Peter has successfully articulated the aspirations of the community to create a fabulous space for us. It is outdoors, focused on baseball, connected to Minnesota, and sustainable and green. He played a central role in the approval, the design, the construction, the inauguration, and now the ongoing operation of Target Field. It is an example of his meaningful work, an achievement that will continue to have an impact on our community for decades to come. And here's another example. 
A number of times in the past few years, the Minnesota Twins have been named to the lists of top workplaces. And as an employee of the Minnesota Twins, where I give tours and I work in the education program, I can tell you there is a lot of employee satisfaction. People love to work for the Twins, and they stay with the organization over the long haul. I'm about to start my fifth year. Dave's been with the Twins since 1990, and my boss in the tour department has been with the Twins, I think, since about 1886. Is that right? <laughs> I think Rick helped to invent baseball, as a matter of fact. Much of the pride in working for the Twins comes from a tone that's set at the top of the organization. When I see Dave St. Peter in the employee dining room or walking along on the service level, he always smiles and says hello, always. He greets everyone, of course, not just me, and it helps people feel valued and recognized for whatever job they do. It's a small thing, perhaps, but it is meaningful, and it makes a difference. So as you can tell, Dave St. Peter is a pretty remarkable guy, and you will enjoy hearing from him. His topic today is the strategy and vision for baseball growth and sustainability. Please join me in welcoming the president of the Minnesota Twins Baseball Club, Dave St. Peter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kristen. I, uh, I'm very grateful that you left out the part that we lost 95 games the last three years. So thank you very much. So um, just as we scripted it. Well, it is an honor uh, to be here tonight. And Kristen, I just want to say thank you um, in all seriousness for that introduction. You are part of a group of people at the Twins organization that I, I will tell you that every single day I feel blessed. Um, to not only have an opportunity to get up and, and, and work in an industry that I'm passionate about and enjoy, but have a chance to work with people um, that really come from all walks of life, that come together around this wonderful thing called baseball and this wonderful organization known as the Minnesota Twins. And you're part of a tour group or education program that is, frankly, the envy of Major League Baseball. That's been probably one of the most replicated elements um, in terms of what we do and how we utilize target field to leverage it with a curriculum for youngsters throughout the state. It's something we're very proud of, so thank you for your efforts there. Um, I will tell you, it is nice to be at Augsburg tonight. I uh, was, uh, was actually delayed my, my trip to Fort Myers to, to give this speech here tonight. Uh, you might think I'm nuts. However, um, I think yesterday was, uh, or today was mid-20s in Minneapolis, you know, we're rejoicing. It was the mid-20s in Atlanta, and they're panicking. So it's been a long, long winter, and I think more than any other year that I can remember, I think this part of the country is ready for some baseball. We're ready for some spring. Um, it is great to be part of the Strumman series. Uh, I certainly have known a little bit about this series, and some of the names of some of the people that have spoke here, all of those names are are, are really, to me, legendary folks. It's, I'm not really sure what I'm doing here, but I'll do my best. Um, and I will tell you that the only thing I can think of is that somebody over here at Augsburg is looking for all-star game tickets. So um, you know, I'll, I'll do my best on that. I know that we, um, we also at the Twins are always, always honored to have, to host Augsburg night um, at, at Target Field each summer. I think, do we have a date for this year? At some time, June 19th, wonderful. I think we're playing the White Sox that night. So, you know, one of the things that Augsburg night and Luther night, those are the two nights we have to bring in the most security in the ballpark. Um, and there's no doubt that our beer per caps will be up that night. So that's a good thing. So, um, you know, I want to, I just want to uh, reference one guy that, that, is, uh, that is here with me tonight. Uh, somebody referenced him as my handler. It's far from that. But um, when I, when I, joined the Twins in 1990. I was actually hired as an intern at the Twins, and the guy who hired me is Mark Weber. Mark actually now has a son, David, uh, who I think was supposed to be here tonight, but I think he has basketball practice. He's on the basketball team here at Augsburg, and uh, hopefully they're going to have a strong finish to their season. Mark's a parent of two boys that I think have graduated or will graduate from Augsburg. So and he's been a great uh, friend to me and a great mentor to me, and there's no doubt I would not be standing here today if he hadn't hired me. So if my speech sucks tonight, blame Mark Weber. Mark Weber right down here. There he goes. So, um, you know, I will tell you that, uh, you know, as I go out and do a lot of speaking, it's rare that I don't chat a little bit about baseball. I know the vision for this talk tonight is, is a little bit different. I'll certainly share my story, maybe talk a little bit about what my role is 
in, in terms of what does the president of a Major League Baseball team do. Um, we'll certainly talk baseball, speak to the business of baseball, maybe a little bit of the, uh, the, the state of Major League Baseball uh, as an entity, and of course the state of the Minnesota Twins, both on the field, which I know there's some great Twins fans here that want to, to see us take a step forward, which I think will happen here over the next seven months, and then what we do off the field. And then, and then lastly, I also want to speak to a little bit about what I think is really central um, to uh, my role, which is being a steward for what I think is the Twins brand. Um, every major entity, and certainly some of the speakers that were here before, whether it be U.S. Bank or Ecolab or whether it be Augsburg, we all are very uh, focused on building and evolving and ultimately protecting the brand that is such a central part of our connection to our, our clients, to our students, to our, in our case, our fans. Um, I grew up a, a, a diehard uh, sports fan uh, in Bismarck, North Dakota, a very middle uh, of the road, uh, average uh, family. Um, I, uh, I made many trips in the back of a station wagon to come down to the Twin Cities to attend Major League Sports. So Twins games at Met Stadium, later at the Metrodome, Vikings games, North Star games, University of Minnesota games. Uh, as a kid, going to Fargo was going to a big city for me. So um, I will tell you that I'm, I, I hate to admit it, I grew up a Yankees fan. Um, I'm happy to say that I've been cured of that affliction. Um, um, but I loved the Yankees as a kid. Um, ended up going to the University of North Dakota. Now, frankly, I would have gone to Augsburg, but I don't think I could get into Augsburg at the time. Um, but, but the University of North Dakota, which, which, which was a wonderful, wonderful place for me to land, I was fortunate enough to have um, perhaps the vision or perhaps just the luck uh, to develop a game plan relatively early in my collegiate career. As a freshman, um, late in my freshman year, at the age of 19, I decided that I really wanted to focus on combining something I was passionate about, specifically sports, with something that I was very interested in, specifically media or communications. And from really day one of my sophomore year on, uh, not only was my academic uh, uh, focus uh, around uh, that combination, but more importantly for me is what was happening outside of the classroom. And I share that for the students in this room. Is, is It's never too early to start really building on your resume and building your portfolio. Um, I see too many students that come to see me uh, on a regular basis that are just looking for their start. And, and what I routinely tell them is that look at this campus you're on. There are hundreds of opportunities right here on this campus to build on a resume. So I was able to do that through a lot of freelance writing, through working in the sports information office at the University of North Dakota, working at the Grand Forks Herald, and that game plan gave me a lot of tangible work experience. Ended up moving to the Twin Cities, was fortunate enough to get an internship with the Minnesota North Stars. Uh, and really, uh, after about a month working for the North Stars, I had been bit by the professional sports bug and really had decided that this was the industry that I really wanted to focus on. Now, I would have loved a full-time job at the North Stars. That did not happen. Uh, I, was, uh, I served out my internship, was looking for work. Uh, that's where I had the fortunate opportunity to meet Mr. Weber. He offered me an internship in the marketing promotions department at the Minnesota Twins and I've been there ever since. 2014 will be my 25th season working in baseball. My first full-time job at the Twins was working in the Twins Pro Shops in Richfield, Minnesota. Of course, the sales in 1991 went through the roof and that had zero to do with my management of that store. It had everything to do with Kirby Puckett and Jack Morris and Chuck Knobloch. I moved into the front office for the first time in February of 1992. And uh, over time, I've been very, very fortunate. I've been promoted. Uh, to different opportunities. I focused originally on communications and PR, ultimately went into the business side in terms of overseeing all of our revenue streams in 1999 and was named president in the fall of 2002. And as my role as the president of the baseball team, you might wonder what, what, what that means. It means I give a lot of speeches like this tonight. Uh, but ultimately, I'm responsible for the business performance of the Twins, the P&L, so to speak. Um, and I lead our executive management team. So certainly there's that 
always that balance between baseball and the business side. And my job in many ways is to bridge that gap. It makes it a lot easier when you have a baseball department that we've been blessed with over time and, and quality people like a Terry Ryan or a Bill Smith. And I might say as an aside, I got a very good medical report this morning on Mr. Ryan. Terry is doing very well at the Mayo Clinic. He's as ornery as ever. He's asking about players. That's a good sign. He's going to be back at the helm here in the very near future. But my job is really to, to, to really focus and oversee both of those areas, understanding that as a Twins fan, be very confident that we hire really good baseball people and allow them to focus on the baseball decisions. Ultimately, my job is to be a liaison with Major League Baseball, with the commissioner's office and all the other clubs. Uh, my role is to be really a, a lead person in ensuring that we are not only nurturing but building stronger partnerships with our government partners, our civic partners, our corporate partners. I'm, I'm unfortunately uh, thrust in times to being a good, close, personal friend of Sid Hartman. I do a lot of media, uh, a lot of community-type elements, and at the end of the day, uh, I view every opportunity that I can uh, to speak to a group like this or speak to a smaller group of people as a focus group. Because the great thing about my job is, is everybody in this room is here for a different reason. There's probably some folks that might be interested in a career, but I know this, there's probably just some great baseball fans in this room. And every one of you baseball fans has an idea on how what we can be doing to get better. And ultimately, that's the stuff that makes us better, is hearing directly from our fans. In terms of things that have maybe been central to any success that I've had um, over time, um, in terms of my career, uh, I think it starts with a single word, and that word is passion. Um, I certainly had a passion for sports. Uh, ultimately, I had a passion for baseball. Um, there's not a day that goes by that I drudge, really dread going to work. I, I understand and, and respect how blessed I've been, and I don't think I've ever taken it for granted. I've always, uh, it's funny, now I meet with interns on a regular basis. When I interned for Mark at the Twins, this shows you how the business has changed. Um, I think we had three interns in the whole organization. This year the Twins will have 43 interns. So I met with them last week, and the message I gave to them is, you have to remember, folks, is that your 43 folks that got to selected to, to intern for the Minnesota Twins during an all-star year, um, we had a, probably 1,500 resumes for those 43 jobs. So I told those 43 youngsters, I said, just respect that and work every single day understanding that you have an opportunity here that literally thousands of people wanted. And that's really the approach that I try to take every single day with my role at the Twins. I think I've been blessed, thanks to my parents, with a strong value system and I always try to put it through a filter in terms of trying to do the right thing. Um, I think that character has certainly served our organization well over time. Work ethic. Um, I realized uh, as a pretty, pretty early in my career, I was not going to be the smartest guy in the room. Um, not to suggest that I'm an idiot or stupid, but I understand there are always going to be smarter people. And uh, a couple things I learned on that. One is I was going to need to outwork everybody in the room. And two, hire some really smart people. So those two things, I think, have paid off for me over time. I've had great mentors. Uh, Mark Weber, I mentioned. Uh, I had a chance, obviously, to work for Carl Polad uh, for many years. He's the one that named me the president in 02, one of the greatest uh, pioneering business people this state has ever known. Jerry Bell, our former president of the club. Uh, we would not have Target Field today, and it would not be as great as it is without Jerry Bell. Um, people like Tom Kelly, uh, our old manager. Tom Kelly taught me the importance of being organized. The old adage about being on time is being 15 minutes early. Uh, things of that nature that I think have served me well. Um, and then certainly I would say having a type A personality or having a sense of urgency. If there's one thing that frustrates me as a parent uh, of three teenage boys or something that I see generally with maybe a new generation of folks who are looking to carve out a career in sports or in business, is I, I, tend, to not, I, I tend to not see as many type A folks. I tend to see a lot of entitlement and a lot of maybe, maybe not lack of willingness to start at the bottom and move way, their way through a company. Um, I've tried to be accessible uh, over time and try to be responsive. Uh, and that means returning phone calls. Uh, it means returning emails. In today's world, it means returning, uh, returning uh, texts or, frankly, uh, being active on Twitter and responding to our fans. Um, I also think that I've tried to learn from many mistakes, made a lot of mistakes along the way. I was named the president of a Major League Baseball team at the age of 34, um, and I will be blunt with you, um, there were many days I'd ask myself, what the hell am I doing? 
Um, but I surrounded myself with good people, and we made mistakes along the way, but I think I've tried to learn from those. And then I'd say I think the, probably the most important thing is, is understanding that relationships matter, that despite all the technology and all of the, the, the world we live in, at the end of the day, it's one-on-one, -on -one, hand to hand combat, so to speak, in, in terms of nurturing relationships and building partnerships and ultimately building friendships. In terms of Major League Baseball, um, I will tell you that the, the game of baseball is probably as healthy today uh, as it's ever been. Um, baseball as an industry is the single most peaceful sport uh, you're going to have in terms of labor peace. If you were to stack it up with the NFL, the NBA and the NHL, baseball now has had the longest period of labor peace in the history of our game. And that's something that you certainly couldn't take for granted 25 years ago when I started. The financial health of Major League Baseball is very strong. It's probably about a $9 billion business as we speak here today. And the reality of it is, is that there's more competitive balance and parity in baseball than there probably is in the other sports. Uh, and the statistics will back this up if you track teams advancing to the postseason or teams that are winning the World Series. There's a lot of reasons for that. Revenue sharing is a big one. Um, there's much more revenue sharing in the game today than there's ever been. We have something called the competitive balance tax. Uh, and there's ultimately been a revision in our amateur draft and, interna and international signings. I'm very proud of the fact that baseball has the most stringent drug testing system out of any of the professional sports. Uh, most people will never believe that or give the Commissioner Seelig credit for that, but it's true. The drug testing system at baseball goes well beyond anything you're going to find in the National Football League. The digital platform of Major League Baseball, the way we follow games now on our phones, Major League Baseball Advanced Media is a huge success and a tremendous entity and an asset for Major, for Major League Baseball. One of the big storylines to keep an eye on here in the next year is we will have a new commissioner of Major League Baseball. Uh, Bud Selig will step down at the end of this year, and that will be a key driver in terms of the future growth of the game. In terms of the Minnesota Twins organization, I will tell you that we're very focused on getting better on the field. Uh, the last three seasons have been... Uh, my word, unacceptable. Um, and I will tell you that we understand what it's going to take to get back to playing the type of baseball that you as Twins fans not only want but ultimately deserve. We need to pitch better. A lot of it goes down to what happens on that, on that, on that mound. Uh, we spent a tremendous amount of money early this offseason to try to shore up our starting pitching. We think that will be much more stable in 2014. We know our bullpen, which has been one of the better bullpens in the league the last two years, will be back and anchored by Mr. Perkins as our closer. We believe we'll play solid defense. I think the big question about our club this year is where's the offense going to come from? Uh, certainly Joe Maurer going to first base is going to get a lot of focus over there. Uh, we need the likes of Josh Willingham and Chris Parmalee and Trevor Plouffe and some of these other guys who have been around for a while to really step up. The thing that I'm most excited about is that we have a wave of young players that are knocking on the door that, that I think remind me a lot of waves we've had in the past, whether it was in the early 80s or was it, whether it was in the late 90s. Um, every uh, successful run the Twins have ever had has been fueled by our minor league system. Um, the likes of uh, Byron Buxton and Miguel Sano and Alex Meyer, uh, these guys have an opportunity to be very special. They're going to be young players, so they're obviously going to have their growing pains. But I think that you will see one or two or maybe all three of those guys in 2014. And the reality of it is that there's an incremental wave beyond those three guys that should be here in 2015. The future for our club is very, very bright, and I'm excited about that. We're also blessed with just tremendous fan avidity in terms of our fans. Our fans have been patient. Um, ultimately, uh, it starts at the ballpark in terms of our ticket base. We'll probably have north of 17,000 season ticket holders again this year. That'll put us in the top 10 of Major League Baseball. That does not happen by accident. There's a lot of hard work at the Twins, but more importantly, there's still a value proposition there that people certainly are supportive, and we don't take that for granted. Television viewership continues to be very, very strong. Uh, in fact, one of the things I'll be happy to say is we were just able to extend Burt Blylevin to continue to be the, the color analyst of the Minnesota Twins on games on Fox North. Um, for those of you scoring at home, we put a bonus clause into Burt's contract that if he can get through another year without dropping an F-bomb, we'll extend him out another five years. So keep an eye on that. Um, but we're very blessed to have a very strong base of television and radio 
um, avidity in terms of ranking at, at or near the top of the game, despite, again, three consecutive very difficult years. That speaks to this really maturing as a baseball market, uh, and I'd argue it's one of the better baseball markets in the game. The corporate support uh, that the Twins and the other teams in this town receive is remarkable. Um, we cannot have a better naming rights partner than Target. Um, we could not have a better founding partnership base than U.S. Bank and Best Buy and the Prairie Island Indian community. Um, that corporate support, again, uh, ranks very high in this country and gives the Twins a very unique advantage. And then I'd say beyond that, in terms of media partnerships, I mentioned Fox Sports North, certainly uh, K-Twin, our radio partner, and the Treasure Island Baseball Network, uh, puts us in a very strong position in terms of the accessibility of our product. We mentioned facilities, as Kristen mentioned, where we obviously we're very blessed uh, with Target Field. Um, we believe Target Field is certainly uh, one of the best sports facilities in the world. Um, I think there's no doubt that it's, it's one of the great ballparks in America. And we're very focused through really Jim Polad's vision and leadership and pocketbook to try to continue to make it better. In 2014, uh, a lot of our focus will be on three areas. First and foremost, we are working very closely with the county to finalize and to really enhance the region's intermodal transit hub known as Target Field Station, uh, which will exist right outside of Gate 6 at Target Field. Uh, we believe that when the green line starts running in June, that we'll see upwards of 25% of our fans coming via light rail to Target Field, which is pretty remarkable for the relatively limited amount of infrastructure we have in this part of the country. Secondly, we're very focused on technology. Technology continues to be the single biggest driver of change in this country, and baseball is no different. It will be the single biggest driver of change in terms of your game day experience. Uh, we are rebooting and, and basically putting in a completely new wall-to-wall -wall Wi-Fi wi system throughout Target Field. Uh, in addition to that, we're putting in a social media clubhouse and ultimately looking at different ways where technology through iBeacon technology, through Apple, can continue to be really driving a personal uh, game day experience for our fans. And then I'd say lastly uh, on Target Field is we also continue to be very focused on food and beverage. Uh, it is amazing to see how much our fans like to eat when they come to the ballpark. But, um, we continually challenge ourselves about what can we do, much like the state fair, that is new and that is exciting and that is groundbreaking. And I'm really, really jazzed about a couple really hot new signature local branded foods that are going to be at Target Field announced here in late March. So stay tuned for that. Um, in addition to facilities, anybody here that's going to get the spring training, we're going through about a $50 million renovation in Fort Myers to renovate the Lee County Sports Complex. Um, uh, that will be a game changer for us, not only from a fan experience perspective, but also from a player development perspective. I always tell my friends in football, um, and frankly basketball and hockey, that one of the great advantages baseball has is spring training. Uh, if you're going to work for a team or you're going to be a fan of a team, I'll give you these choices. You can go to watch the Vikings uh, training camp in Mankato in August. Uh, you can go watch the Timberwolves training camp in Mankato in October or you can go watch the Wilds training camp in St. Paul in September, or you can come to Fort Myers in March. Which one would you guys pick? <laughs> the other thing about Target Field is that I think that we are committed to continuing to make it a community asset beyond baseball and beyond Twins baseball. So amateur baseball, we're very excited to have for the fifth straight year, the State High School Baseball Championships, the Prep Championship Series on June 14th. We're also very focused on music. You will see uh, a lot of music at Target Field in 2014. I'm very optimistic you'll see a major concert with a major international star on August the 2nd. Uh, that's the only hint you're going to get. Stay tuned. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm very optimistic you will see a return of uh, amphitheater shows. We tested one last year, and it was a huge home run. When the Skyline Music Series is announced, I, I will invite you come on out. You will have a ball. Uh, Target Field works great in a small amphitheater setting with seven to 10,000 people. Uh, in addition to that, we're working very hard on a couple other things that are a little bit more non-traditional. Soccer, uh, I think you will see soccer played at Target Field in the next year or two. Um, potentially an international type friendly featuring a Premier League team. And then in addition to that, kind of my dream scenario as a kid who went to the University of North Dakota and loves hockey, is we're working very closely with the Wild to try to bring the National Hockey League's Winter Classic to Target Field at some point in the next couple of years. 
Of course, the All-Star Game is coming to Target Field in July of this year, and that is a once-in-a-generation event. Um, it really, in my mind, will open the next wave of huge events that will be coming to Minnesota over the next five to seven years. Uh, the Ryder Cup will be at Hazeltine in 2016. You will see a Super Bowl come here. You will see a Final Four come here. And ultimately, for the Twins, I will tell you that we're working very, very hard to push Major League Baseball to localize the All-Star Game. The thing that's cool about the All-Star Game is certainly there's a three-day event at Target Field. Uh, when the All-Star Game was here in 1985 in the Metrodome or, night, or at the Met Stadium in 1965, it was a one-day event. Now it's really a week-long series of events. So at Target Field, we'll have the Futures Game on Sunday. Uh, we'll have, the obviously, the Home Run Derby. The first ever Home Run Derby was actually held at the Metrodome in 1985. Um, and then, of course, the Target Field, the All-Star Game on, on Tuesday. But in addition to that, there will be tremendous opportunities for fans and for the community to engage, um, it, whether it be the red carpet parade on the day of the All-Star Game or Fan Fest, or we're working on a free public concert that will take place probably at TCF Bank Stadium on the Saturday night before the game. The All-Star Game is going to be something you're going to be hearing quite a bit about, and, and we're pretty fired up about it. Um, before I close here and take questions, I want to speak to probably four or five things that, in my mind, are really central to the brand of the Minnesota Twins, or what we like to call the Twins tradition. And it really dates back to 1961. The Minnesota Twins, of course, uh, were born in 1961 when the Washington Senators moved uh, to the Twin Cities. And I have to give both the Griffith family, the owners of the team, uh, until 1984, and then the Polad family the credit for really again, shepherding this brand and, and staying disciplined and promoting stability and continuity amongst that brand. It starts, in, in, but it doesn't stop, but it certainly starts with the winning tradition. And that's why the last three years have been really disappointing for those of us who work inside the Twins. There are certainly uh, external expectations, and we respect that, but I can assure you there are very high internal expectations about winning baseball games. That's been a central part of our history in Minnesota, and that needs to continue. I think the second thing I'd point to is family. Um, I think that when you think of the Minnesota Twins, generally the first word that comes to mind for a lot of people is family. The reality of it is it's been a family tradition. It's been passed down. How many people in this room didn't go to games as a kid or now bring your kid or your grandkids to games? I think that's one of the great drivers of our, of our brand. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. The biggest one is probably the affordability of our product. I think that's one of the huge advantages that Major League Baseball has and certainly the Twins have, and we need to continue to focus on that. In addition to that, I think is the environment that you find at the ballpark. We spend a tremendous amount of time not only focusing on great customer service or food and beverage, but we want to make sure that it's a family-friendly environment to come to a ball game. And that's something you can't take for granted today in the world of professional sports or even college sports. And I'm very proud of the fact that when you come to a game at Target Field, it's a family atmosphere. I think the other thing from a Twins perspective that we continue to really focus on is relationships and partnerships, accessibility, trying to pick up your phone, being accessible to the media. Um, I always tell our employees, check your ego at the door, be humble, um, and a commitment to superior customer service. I don't think there's anything that is more important for us than I can't control necessarily what's going to happen out on that baseball field night after night, but I'd like to believe we can control how we greet our guests when they come inside the ballpark, um, ultimately how cold that beer is, how warm that hot dog is, and ultimately trying to do it with a smile on your face. And then I'd say uh, there's two other really critical points, and they, and they somewhat go hand in hand. One is community. Um, it certainly, again, starts with our ownership in terms of a commitment to philanthropy and giving back. But I've been, I can tell you, very, very blessed over the years at the Twins to work with some tremendously gifted and skilled baseball players. But I think the best thing about the Twins organization over the years is that we've also had good human beings. Uh, there has not been a single night where I've lost sleep over where our players are at or what we're doing. And knock on wood, because they're all human. But in today's world where sports center night after night is filled with a police blotter, um, I'm proud of the fact that the Minnesota Twins are not part of that dialogue. And I think our fans have been as well. Um, you know, we, uh, we've had good human beings wearing our uniform, and I think that counts. In addition to that, I'm very proud of the work of the Twins Community Fund, which is our 501c3, which is governed by a board of, 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 of really fans from throughout the upper Midwest. 
uh, in the work of that community fund around Fields for Kids or our RBI program and the fact that just last summer about 7,000 kids played baseball in Minneapolis and St. Paul's urban areas for free, um, you know, thanks to that program. Uh, that's something that I can be very, very proud of. Um, and then I will also point out in terms of the All-Star Game is one of the things that will be announced in the very near future here is we will finalize plans for about $5 million of capital grants thanks to Major League Baseball and the Polad Family Foundation that will go back into this community. Uh, and that'll be something that really, be, really will be very, very cool. And then I'd say lastly, and, and what I also try to remind people is that it's about fun. Um, everything that happens at Target Field should be put through a fun filter. Um, people come to our ball games for fun. They come there for entertainment. They come there for excitement. They come there to cheer on their team. But if at any point it's not fun, then that's a problem. And obviously it goes back to that winning, but it also goes to the way we try to, 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 to refine and shape that experience at the ballpark and wherever we're out in the community, whether it be with our players, our mascot, our television broadcast, our radio broadcast, broadcast et cetera. Fun really, truly does matter. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'd love to take questions um, on any front. Uh, if anybody wants to um, try out for third base, we can go out here in, in the back. And well, Trevor Plouffe's going to be our third baseman, and I'm predicting he's going to be okay. So there's Chad Jackson. Now here's another guy. So he walked in late. Why don't you stand up, Chad? So this, this, this young man over here, um, we hired as an intern in what year, Chad? Okay, so 1995-96, Chad was an Augsburg a student at the time we interviewed him. Uh, I believe he's a football player over here. A uh, lot of speed, but no hands. And, um, <laughs> and uh, he's a Duluth uh, native, but Chad has come, Chad, I'm very proud of Chad because he interviewed for that, and, he, and this was a young man who, who obviously had been, uh, had, had been well-schooled here at this, at this institution. And he's a great ambassador for Augsburg. And he's, he came to the Twins. He left the Twins. Now he came back a couple years ago. He's in our corporate partnerships division. And uh, Chad's somebody that Augsburg, Augsburg can be proud of. He's a future team president, I can tell you that. I mean that, Chad. You're just not going to get my job, but you can get somebody else's. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, any questions out there? We've got to have some questions. This is on tape, so I'm, gonna, I'm sure I said something here tonight that's going to come back to bite me. So... Question is if there's going to be another signing. Um, you know, I, 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 would, I would say this. I don't think our roster's set. I, I think you're going to see something happen. I, I'd be surprised if we didn't add a piece before opening day. I'm not quite sure how that's going to uh, manifest itself. It could come in a form of a trade. I don't know if it'll be free agent. Um, but as rosters kind of get set, guys are out of options, things are going to happen. We've got a number of guys out of options on our club. So... We have some tougher decisions to make. Same with some other teams. Uh, I think we'd like to add a bat. And if that, you know, let's see what happens. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I've never, in all my years of the Twins, you get to spring training, you think, even on your years when you think you're completely set, guys get hurt, things happen. So um, there will be some opportunities to get better. Yes, in the back. Hi, Dave. Hi. I, I teach risk uh, assessment and risk management at Augsburg. And I'm curious in terms of uh, how you view uh, Joe Maurer as an asset. In other words, it seems like your fortunes are really dependent relative to other baseball organizations on one player. And if Joe breaks a leg, um, you know, it, it strikes me that you're really, really at risk uh, and don't have a lot of diversification, if you will, among your players. The other, the other factor is, given that Joe accounts for such a big significant part of your payroll, it really limits your resources in terms of acquiring other players and building a contender. And I just wanted to know if you yeah. agreed with that and how you, how you kind of assess that. Well, I don't, I don't agree with the last part. I, I don't think that Joe's salary limits our ability to bring in other players. Um, we don't have a payroll issue here. We have a, we have a, we have a personnel issue. We had to make better baseball decisions. Uh, we have plenty of payroll here to win. If you go back and look at last year, it's Twins payroll, and look at the teams that went to the postseason, there were multiple teams with a lesser payroll than the Twins that went to the postseason. So um, I think in terms of the, the, the first part of the question, um, uh, you know, again, I, I don't view Joe Maurer as the problem. I view him as part of the solution. 
Uh, he's held to an incredibly high standard that I'm not sure is ultimately fair, but it comes with the territory when you're going to earn that type of money. Um, he's a gifted player offensively, um, but ultimately he doesn't pitch. Um, you know, he's one guy on a baseball field. It's a team game, and we need to get better pitching. I, I think if we pitch better, a lot of these things will, frankly, take care of themselves. Our starting pitching last year was putrid. I can't put it any other way. Um, it just it was putrid. It was horrible. And as bad as our offense was, our starting pitching was worse. So um, I don't view, again, Joe Maurer as a problem. I've, or, and, and I will flat out tell you, if we had to do that contract again, we would do it. Uh, Joe Maurer is going to the Hall of Fame someday. He's going to go into the Hall of Fame as a Minnesota twin. And I think ultimately history will show him to be one of the great hitters this game has ever seen. I'll be surprised. I'll be surprised if he doesn't have a monster offensive year. Uh, coming out from behind the plate. I'm hoping he's going to play 150 to 160 games. I think you'll see a little bit more power because I think he'll be fresher. Um, but this guy last year finished second in the American League in hitting, and it's a ho-hum year. Uh, you know, he hit 330. So, you know, what is he, what's he got to do? I mean, that's, that's good stuff. Joe Maurer, again, is not the problem with the Twins. We're getting what we needed out of Joe Maurer. Yes. Yeah, it was a lot more about his on-field talents, and we ultimately need to surround him with better with better players. Um, but certainly, whenever you're going to sign a, a player like that, you take into some of those other factors. That you know, here's a hometown guy, somebody who's good in the community, somebody that we know that can handle a contract like that. Um, and certainly, all of those elements are part of it. But make no mistake, it's, there's a baseball focus there, and um, you know, that's the biggest part of that. That's the biggest part of that decision. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, somebody told me the other day they think we ought to hire a few more jerks who can pitch. Um, <laughs> um, um, I'd like to think we can do both, right? Have good guys who can pitch. We've proved that. No, um, you know, I, I, it isn't by accident. I, you know, I, I think there's a few reasons for it. I appreciate the question. Um, I will tell you that when we, when we go into the amateur draft and draft players or go into the Dominican Republic through the international signing world, um, there's a pretty heavy filter around what we call makeup or character. That's a huge box that you got to check. And there are many examples of players that we have either not drafted or not signed because we thought they were going to be misses around character. And um, there are some of those examples that we probably wish we could have back. There's others that we felt like we made the right decision on. Um, I think the flip side of that, though, the other part of it is, is your leadership. It comes down to when a young player comes into your system, who are you going to surround that young player with in terms of showing them uh, you know, the way, how to be a big leaguer, how to conduct themselves in a professional manner? And the people I give the most credit to that over the years were originally Andy McPhail and Tom Kelly, and now uh, Ron Gardenhire and, and Terry Ryan. Uh, there's a tone that is set inside of our organization about what is expected and the way it go, go about their business. And, um, that's helped, and you know, one generation of players has helps kind of pass it down to the next. Um, the other thing is, is that players are held accountable. Um, if a player makes a mistake, that's fine. We're all human, but ultimately, they should learn from that. And if they don't, you won't see them with the Minnesota Twins. Um, we'll make personnel decisions based on that, and not every team will do that. You'll see that being more common today than maybe where it was 10 to 15 years ago. But I think it's an important part of what we we try to be about. We understand people are human and they're going to make mistakes, but you should hopefully they're going to learn from those mistakes and not repeat them. Yes. Um, I had a quick question more about um, how you um, thought about looking at all those applications for internships. Well, and I didn't how, look at all of them. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how is it that the, the what things did you really uh, consider in deciding that you want to talk to somebody like Chad and, and, and ultimately higher? Well, I think, that, I think that's a great question. I, you know, there's a few things I'd point out that I think are difference makers um, relative to you know, your resume, so to speak. Certainly people who 
uh, people who are, are, are uh, active outside of the classroom. I mean, frankly, GPA is probably the last thing I would look at. Um, not to say it doesn't matter on some level, but it's the last thing I would focus on. I'd focus on people who have a lot of balls in the air, people who can juggle, you know, so extracurricular activities, other jobs, other clubs, things of that nature. Secondly, for me, the biggest thing that's missing is writing skills. The ability to, you know, write in more than 140 characters. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, I see with my own kids, you know, I'm, you know, I'm upstairs and they're downstairs and they're sending me a text, get off, off your butt and walk up. Um, but writing skills, you know, being able to write a letter, being able to write a memo, being able to, you know, write an email of, that's, that's in English um, would be helpful. Uh, and then I'd say interpersonal skills. Um, and that doesn't come across on a resume as much as, when you meet with somebody, but their ability to be confident and, and look you in the eye. Because, you know, for our interns, we ask our interns to interact with all kinds of different partners, all kinds of different guests. And they play a big role, just like all of our staff does, on helping shape experiences. So those things are important. But, um, you know, those are some of the aspects that I think are important. Work in the community. Somebody who understands that, you know, that they might have an opportunity to make our community or world a better place. And you see that a lot, a lot of young, talented people. The comp I, I will just say this before I go to that. The competition for internships is so much more intense than when I got it. I'm not sure I would have gotten an internship back if I was applying today compared to back then. Yes, I wouldn't um, have passed the background check. I know that. Yes, go ahead. So, so my questions revolve around the stadium. Um, was it important to get something done before the Vikings and Timberwolves for strategic purposes? What were some of the challenges during the process, like deciding yeah. open air versus domed? And then um, are there it's any good. things that you didn't do that, or did do that you wish would be different? Yeah, I love, you know, it's funny. You go through the process. We, we, were, we worked for 10 years um, to resolve the ballpark debate. The F Twins first uttered the word new ballpark in the fall of 1995. So we didn't ultimately get approval to build Target Field from the legislature until May of 06. So that 11-year period was, uh, was a challenge. Um, I will say it was not a strategic piece for the Twins to be in front of the Vikings or to be in front of the, the Target Center, the Wolves, remembering uh, the Metrodome was built in 1982. So it was always a pretty good football stadium. Um, our piece was is that we were playing baseball in the corner of a football stadium. And it took a while for that part of the debate to really resonate with fans and with legislators and with people. Um, so, all, but, but it wasn't about getting ahead of those other teams. And um, at the end of the day, it was more about how can we preserve this franchise for the long term, because that certainly was in debate throughout that period of time, uh, dealing with potential moves of the team, sales of the team, contraction, all of those things. And then the second part of that was is, how can we present the game the way it's meant to be presented? And for us, we thought that was going to be with a facility like Target Field. Now, roof or no roof, that's a fair debate. And the Minnesota Twins, the first nine years of that period, would have said we need a roof on the ballpark. Uh, we need something like Miller Park in Milwaukee or Safeco Field in Seattle. The reality of it is, as Hennepin County emerged, with a plan to build a compact urban ballpark in the North Loop neighborhood of downtown Minneapolis. And they said, do you want in or do you want out? And our ownership needed to make a decision. Do we want to build an urban ballpark and roll the dice, so to speak, on the weather? Or do we want to continue to hold out for a roof? The reality is, is the Hennepin County package was saleable at the legislature. 87 counties in the state, 86 paid nothing for Target Field. Not a nickel of state money in Target Field. Not a nickel. That package was saleable. Our ownership decided, look, let's proceed. Mike Opat is the leader of Hennepin County, and the rest is history. He ended up getting it approved, and ultimately Target Field was built. Now, what's ironic about it is that if I'd have pulled the state of Minnesota before Target Field opened, they'd have said, you need a roof. If I'd have pulled them now, they would, most of them would say, you don't need a roof. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's allowed us to present baseball in a much more compact, urban way. Uh, and that's added to the prestige of Target Field. Now, I could have used a roof a couple days last April, but outside of that, it's been pretty good. And, I, and I'll have that debate until, you know, our weather's not that much different than it is in Boston or New York or Cleveland or Chicago, and outdoor baseball's worked there for 100 years. 
Yes. Uh, I think I heard Lavelle Neal say something about uh, who? T- oh, I'm sorry. Uh, TV Neal. TV contracts may be playing a factor in the competitive yeah. balance in the future of baseball. And well, you said baseball is pretty competitive right now. Yeah, it's a different model for those of you who are sports fans. The National Football League model, it's all national television money. And the local money, there is really no local television money in the National Football League. In baseball, there is national TV money, but there's a much more of a reliance on local television deals, generally with regional sports networks. The good news is, is there's revenue sharing on all of those dollars. So when you see one of those teams sign one of those whopping local deals, you just have to understand that that's going to ultimately push more money into the revenue sharing system. So it is going to benefit more than just that single team. Uh, there are, the reality of it is, is uh, those television deals are largely driven on uh, statistics around cable and satellite households. And if you Google tonight where Minneapolis, St. Paul, or where Minnesota ranks in cable and satellite households compared to the rest of the country, you'll understand a bit of our conundrum. You know, Minnesota is Minnesota. We don't have the same number of households as they have in Texas or in L.A., or in New York, what have you. So we do the best we can. We think our local television deal is a market deal. Uh, We quietly redid it about three years ago. We didn't have a press conference to announce it. Um, We have enough payroll, and our TV deal is a market deal. Would I love to have more? Yeah, but ultimately, um, I think it's a fair deal, and we have great partners at Fox Sports North. What's it? What's it like to go through life when you're already declared a saint before anything else happens? Oh, boy. Uh, the people that know me know that that's BS. So, um, no, you know, it, it, I appreciate that. No, it's, it's an interesting name to grow up with. Uh, I can tell you that. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, by all means, the question is about an old-fashioned doubleheader. Um, we have all the ability to do it if we wanted to do it. Uh, we last did it, I think, back, going to test me on this, I think it was the mid-2000s or early 2000s. We actually played a scheduled doubleheader. Um, uh, and I will tell you that the, uh, the challenge we'd have on it, and I'll just be blunt with you, the bigger your season ticket base is, the more challenging the economic picture is. Um, at the Metrodome, when we did it, we had a very small season ticket base. So... If you take an average ticket price of $30 times 17,000 season tickets, that gives you a sense of what you'd be walking away from just off the top in terms of revenue. So business-wise, it's a challenging picture. You could argue that you make up with, for it with PR and maybe some incremental single-game sales. Um, I would never say never to that. You see teams try it. There's actually a, a, a proposal to shorten the season in terms of condense the season I should say uh, to still play 162 games but to do it so that you can do it in in maybe 24 weeks or 25 weeks and that would require many more double headers Um, whether that'll ever happen or not I don't know but what that proposal would allow for is is to not be playing the World Series into the month of November which can happen from time to time, or this year opening the season on March 31st, which was when we open it. So that's, it's a fair question. I, I doubt it's going to happen anytime soon, but we'd have the ability to do it if we wanted to do it. Now, that said, we do play a number of doubleheaders each year. We just we play them split day nights, and, uh, and that can you know, make for long days, but that, we do that obviously because of weather. Yes, sir. Cheap Seats program, well, yes. In fact, you'll see it this year at Target Field. Um, it's changed. Um, we do it now through analytics and big data and what we call variable pricing or dynamic pricing. But I'm very optimistic that throughout the months of April and May, you'll see a lot of $5 tickets offered in the outfield seats. And uh, not so much on weekends, but certainly midweek games. And there's like 100 different factors that go into determining price. But I think you'll see that early on. And obviously, again, it goes back to affordability. That's absolutely central in my mind to our brand. There was another question right here. Yes, sir.
appreciate the question. Pace of game is the hottest topic right now at the commissioner's office, uh, bar none. And uh, the reason uh, is similar to what you said in terms of a generation that might not want to uh, enjoy the beauty and some of the elegance of, of baseball. Um, uh, but, you know, so yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge focus. Um, uh, you know, I, it, it's a little bit of a catch-22, uh, and I'll just tell you because, you know, of course, people want television revenues, and, and, and the people that complain the loud, loudest about the pace of the game are two groups of people, people like your sons and then the television networks who don't want the games to be as long when they're doing it. However, when you do the research and you look at the games from, say, 1965, and then you look at last year's games, I think the statistic shows that games on average are 28 minutes longer. Well, the reality of it is, is 24 of those 28 minutes are because the television breaks are longer. So, you know, the TV networks are creating part of the problem. Um, I will tell you that I think what you're going to see ultimately, and this will be something to watch for, is umpires are going to be empowered to enforce rules that already exist about getting out of the batter's box, about pitchers throwing the ball when they're on the mound, some of those things. It's going to require the umpires to police it and to ultimately get it going because you're not going to shorten the game from nine innings to seven innings. We're going to play nine innings. It's ultimately con con conducive on those umpires to retrain a group of players, and it probably has to start in the minor leagues, to be honest with you, so that when they get to the major leagues, they understand what's going to be allowed and what's not. One more question? Yes. Do you, oh, you know, I appreciate the question. Um, I have three boys, uh, um, and, and two of the three play baseball. They'll be sophomores this year out at Holy Family in Victoria. I'm not sure what team they'll play on. I hope they'll get a chance to play. They, they, they love it. They're blessed, unfortunately, with their dad's speed, um, and um, that's not going to help them, but, um, but they love the game, and it's been a wonderful thing. As a parent, uh, I will tell you, I, uh, you know, again, I've, I, it was, it's been a wonderful place for my boys to grow up and have access to the twins, and a lot of great moments, and, and, and it's been a privilege ultimately to be part of it, but it's been a great thing for my family. So with that, I just want to say thank you for everybody coming out. I hope Maybe there was a nugget or two that maybe you carried away that, that maybe allowed you to think maybe a little differently about this issue with the Twins or this issue with your career. But uh, it's an honor to be invited to be part of the Strumman series, and we look forward to seeing folks at Target Field this year. Come on out and cheer for the Twins. I think we'll be better, and if we hit a little bit, I think we'll surprise some people. Keep the faith. Thanks. So Dave, I've been teaching at Augsburg for almost 30 years, which if you do the math indicates that I started teaching when I was five years old. <laughs> and in that time, I have never had the privilege of making someone an honorary Augie. Yeah, so, it? <laughs> so it is here at last. Are lower now. <laughs> I, have, I have the chance. Yeah, I know, it's gonna happen right here. <laughs> Get your camera out, man. It's happening, it's happening. So um, welcome to the Augsburg family awesome, awesome. as an as an Augie, and Go here Augie. is your Augsburg Augie baseball, baseball cap. I love it. Thank you. I wear it with pride. Thank you. Now I do have to say that the next time you see me on the service level and you smile and say hello, I'm going to be expecting to see the Augsburg baseball yeah. cap on your head. <laughs> Uh, as we close tonight, um, I would just like to invite you to consider joining us again on March 1st and again March 7th through March 9th for the 26th Nobel Peace Prize Forum. This year it's called Crossing Boundaries to Create Common Ground. We have a number of wonderful speakers, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And Kim, I, I just would like to say that right now I would be glad to volunteer to make him an honorary Augie as well. So if you can come up with another baseball cap, and, and you know, Dave, if you have a Twins cap, I could give him that one too, because one baseball cap is good and two are better, for sure. Uh, Augsburg College, together with the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and the Humphrey School of Public Policy are the major academic sponsors for the Nobel Peace Prize Forum, so please join us. And I hope that you can all stay for pizza and conversation. I think we're heading over to the Christensen Center next, is that right? So thanks, everybody, for coming today, and I hope you have a great evening. And please join me again in thanking Dave St. Peter. <laughs>